Ora, muito boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos. Desta vez, muito boa tarde à hora do almoço. Temos um convidado muito especial, o Jean-François, que vai estar connosco e devido a latitudes e a fusos horários, o nosso PM Talk desta vez decorre à hora do almoço e não ao final da tarde, como normalmente costumamos ter e da forma como costumamos ter. Um, de notar também que o toque será, obviamente, também em inglês, uh, por, por, pelo, nosso inter, pelo nosso orador falar inglês e ser nativo uh, dessa forma, e dessa forma, a partir de agora, transmitiremos para inglês. So, hello everyone, welcome Jean-François, it's a pleasure for us to have you with us. We have just invited and uh, welcomed everyone in our native language in Portuguese and are now going to switch to English so that, well, the final the rest of the presentation can continue. Um, I was just presenting um, the, 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 the presentation that we're going to have about leader coach of the future and how you are um, adamant and you are absolutely convinced that this is um, an, a high relevance matter that everyone should be um, interested in and focused in. Let me start by introducing you. So you are a global executive coach since 2006, and you worked in a career management around the world with a Fortune 500 company. You, you define yourself as passionate about enabling leaders, teams, and organizations to unleash more of their greatness, and wrote the fable about such an adventure with the book Game Changers of the, uh, at the Circus. That's a very interesting title. You are based in Bangkok, and uh, as you are a habit traveler and engage with uh, clients and audiences uh, in 35 countries over six continents. Impressive. By August 2023, you had 16,000 coaching hours and served over 1,600 executives and dozens of executive teams. You are a master certified coach and um, region and country presidents, board members have been with you and your teams And, well, it is now our pleasure and it is now our time to have you with us. So, Jean-François, Jean welcome. And um, let's hear what you have to share. Muito obrigado, Miguel. E muito boa tarde a todos. Uh, this is a new time, right? 1 p.m. for PMI Portugal. <clears throat> new time for new times uh, in connection with... Uh, The topic uh, today uh, we, we're going to uh, discuss uh, together, uh, we, which is really um, leader coach of the future for new times. In fact, it's a lot about uh, what's finding out what's the best leadership uh, we can adopt for troubled times and check if coaching and coaching skills has anything to do with it. Um, now, because this is a high level and uh, a difficult topic, I thought we all should relax first uh, and uh, go through a short musical moment uh, um, before we address the difference that you can make as a leader coach uh, in your capacity as a project manager uh, and why it immensely matters to you and to the future. So I invited two maestros, orchestra conductors, uh, and uh, we'll play a game together as you see them. So here you have number one called Ricardo Muti, and <clears throat> you also have number two uh, contestant, uh, Herbert von Karajan. The story is one of the two got famous uh, and super rich, and another one got actually fired by his orchestra. And the reason why he got fired has a lot to do with our topic today. So the game we're going to play is that you, you find out which one got fired, right? Uh, by typing one or two in the chat box after you listen to 15 seconds of their music. Uh, One if you fire number one, right? Two if you fire number two. And uh, here's the moment where you are the judge. <laughs>
that was number one. Next, we are going to see number two. And when you watch number two, you've got to notice that everybody, musicians and him, have their eyes closed. It, it says something. Now we listen to number two. And that is your time to vote. One, if you fire number one. Two, if you fire number two. Let's see what the chat box uh, has got coming. Uh, mm, my, my, one of the two is getting the boot like seriously, right? Uh, so very interesting. So you unanimously fire number one and you are so right. Ricardo Muti got fired musician. The orchestra of La Scala di Milano, a for a house in Italy. Uh, one day he received a letter, four lines, signed by all 100 musicians of the orchestra. The letter was just saying, Dear Maestro, you are a grande conductore. Uh, is, uh, we do not like to be treated by like robots. And of course, he resigned. Uh, the other one got super famous uh, and very rich with private jet, uh, luxury cars, yacht, castles, everything. The only one ever in classical music. Uh, as you could see, he found out one day that micromanaging the orchestra, forcing the musician to play exactly the music that he thought was beautiful, was not the best outcome for the audience. And in, he decided to experiment with giving his musicians some freedom. Um, uh, so they, they've got to listen to each other and tell the story of the music together intimately. And that made the music that much more beautiful. And it's obviously about empowering leadership. And that led him uh, to succeed until he was 92. And I'll show you his last concert at 92 years of age with a singer called Jesse Norman. You could see this amazing gentleman was very, very old and also very sick. Sadly, he died shortly after that uh, because that was his last concert. Uh, all the music journalists from around the world attended the concert in Vienna. <laughs> and the next day reported in their newspapers the very same message. The music last night as Karajan's last concert was so beautiful, it could not come from this earth. It sounded like uh, it came from above. Uh, and I guess because Karayan was not able to move uh, his hands even much, right? Uh, um, the musicians, uh, he had sufficiently inspired and developed, uh, just did the best show ever. And, um, and that is kind of the proof of what Lao Tzu, Chinese philosopher, uh, said a very long time ago. A leader is best when uh, people barely know he exists. Uh, when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say we did it ourselves, right? Uh, which uh, the musicians of Karayan in that last concert certainly 
can say. Now, that is um, a kind of an introduction to letting go of micromanagement. Uh, but we face more complex environment than at the time when it was already a good idea to uh, experiment with calculated free reign leadership. Now we face a complex, fast changing world with no obvious better way forward. Of course, directive leadership is dead. Uh, and if it's not dead, it is lethal, right? Um, but it's worse than um, it used to be. We've been through the VUCA time. You heard so much about that, right? The time of volatility or fast change, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, right? It's interesting that kind of uh, eight years ago, when I was researching on Google uh, VUCA, I had this picture. And just three years ago, I Googled again VUCA, and I found that picture right? Uh, the big picture and its hard truth. Uh, just in a few years, the representation of VUCA had become so uh, much more intense, right? Uh, and then, and then most recently, um, uh, we came to uh, follow a gentleman called uh, Hamais Cassio um, as uh, he defined a more relevant acronym to describe our business world now than VUCA. The acronym is BANI, uh, B stands for uh, brittle, A for anxious or anxiety inducing, N for nonlinear and I for incomprehensible. So if I, I put it simply, right? Uh, uh, brittle is about the fragility of uh, systems, in fact, right? A virus can suddenly appear uh, and just uh, break everything that seemed strong apart. So what seemed strong was fragile, was vulnerable, in fact. Uh, one problem on one side of the supply chain in some country can have tremendous repercussions on uh, the other side of the world, right? Uh, now, anxiety, um, of course, is very high because, and the certainty that the system, any system is fragile, is hiking it a lot. Uh, Non-linearity -re refers to um, uh, how uh, a small decision can have devastated consequences out of pro proportion with uh, the size of the uh, decision at first look. Uh, um, and the ups and downs can be uh, totally not proportional in uh, an interconnected world, right? And finally, incomprehensible refers to the fact that in a world of big data, right, uh, can we make any sense uh, given data overload? Uh, and then when everything happens so fast, uh, do we have the slightest change, uh, change to change to make change, right? So that is what we're going to have to deal with uh, as leaders um, for the next few years until perhaps it gets even more difficult to have. Um, I recommend that you go to the source of uh, the BANI acronym, which is so helpful for us as leaders or coaches or project managers. Uh, it's uh, an article by Hamais Cassio, based in the US, uh, called uh, Facing the Age of Chaos. And we are going to give the link to that Medium uh, page in the chat box. Uh, so in your own time, you can have a look. Um, I, I, I warmly recommend it. Now, I tried to uh, uh, put um, in a picture uh, some features of the job descriptions of leaders and coaches actually, um, as they got a lot more challenging. Our job uh, in a global world, of course, uh, uh, calls for us to have a global mindset, uh, but also to be able to catalyze collective intelligence because nobody alone is smart enough to figure out the best way forward. And that's something uh, uh, in project management that is really, really important people get, right? Collective intelligence is the most precious currency in business uh, for a, a set, uh, a, a given set of people, right? Uh, 
disruptive creativity, agility, and energy. And I played uh, with this in an article uh, I um, wrote, I'll show you later on, uh, and uh, just generated that other acronym, forgive me for those, uh, ECIA. I stand by uh, my hunch that uh, leaders and coaches must become ECIA agent, E for energy, where they've got to trigger uh, that level of energy that will nurture resilience and boldness uh, to, uh, to enable disruptive creativity. CI for collective intelligence, uh, again, for the sake of positive intelligent uh, disruption, right? And agility. So that whatever we conquer, we conquer it ahead of others because we are faster, right? So. ECIA. Um, the article uh, I wrote for Forbes uh, uh, was titled Successful Leaders Must Become ECI Agents. Here's why and how. And you can uh, access it at your convenience by uh, copying the link to that article in the chat box, right? Um, just a bit of data before we get to uh, some other type of um, information, right? Uh, and this data comes from McKinsey. Uh, when you get the slide deck and you'll get the link to download it uh, in the last five minutes of our conversation today, um, you can click on that link at the bottom here uh, to access the full study from McKinsey, which I thought uh, was very worthwhile, right? Uh, they have just studied uh, recently how leadership uh, was was being re-engineered, in fact, uh, um, during and after the pandemic. And what they uh, uh, managed to find is those kind of uh, uh, behaviors of leaders that uh, were downgraded in red uh, here, and those behaviors in leaders that got upgraded, right? And they were massive massive changes in the game of leadership. At the top here, you see how the being supportive and caring behavior uh, got uh, superstarred, right? Uh, being employee focused, creative and entrepreneurial, empowering and delegating to others, right? So conductor, number two, um, promoting open and trusting environment, uh, embracing rapid decision making. You can see all this is conducing to collective intelligence and uh, agility, of course, right? Being comfortable with ambiguity, taking a holistic view of specific outcomes, uh, and then uh, here at the very bottom, using consulting leadership, um, consultative leadership, which is kind of uh, advising people, telling them what to do, right? Or also uh, downgraded using authoritative leadership and leading from the front. Now, just perhaps uh, a second um, of sharing about consultative leadership. Um, PWC, KPMG, and Accenture have about six, seven years ago, started to invest very, very heavily in training all of their consultants in coaching skills, right? Massively, right? So the bet was they've got to uh, master coaching skills because they will be more precious in their job as consultant with coaching skills uh, to trigger collective intelligence in conversations with clients and with groups of people they work on the, on, on the, on the field with clients than if they uh, stay with uh, just the old style consultant. I know better, I'm smarter, I'm gonna tell you how you're gonna do this and then you will do and I will go. Yeah, uh, so so very interesting, right? Um, that um, McKinsey finds just the same, right? Consultative leadership, very down. Okay, now there's something more that it's important uh, for leaders nowadays um, be able to do, and that is to manage uh, uh, moods and negative moods of employees, right? That can be triggered by so many things. And on that slide, uh, I've put together yet another acronym. Please forgive me. I know it's not very digestible, and I know it's just lunchtime, so double apologies for that. Right? The acronym is SCARF, S-C-A-R-F, put together by a neuroscientist called David Rock. Uh, his article um, is at the bottom of this slide. You can click on it uh, to learn more. 
This guy, together with uh, neuroscientists, uh, have submitted a number of people to brain scans, right? Um, identifying where is, what kind of energy is generated in their brain and where in different environments, in fact. You know, energy in our brains uh, comes in three types, right? Electrical, electromagnetical, and uh, chemical, right? Um, so they monitor all of that with their brain scans, right? And they found that, that there are five critical triggers of energy, can be positive or negative. Uh, so when it's, uh, those triggers are activated in a positive manner, they will trigger positive energy, good for motivation, uh, energizing people to take action, right? That's the meaning of motivation. Uh, and in reverse, uh, when these triggers are activated by negative causes, right? Um, then uh, um, they will trigger a fight or flight negative energy. First one of these triggers is status um, or self-esteem, right? Uh, so when people fear that they're going to lose self-esteem, uh, then uh, their level of positive energy dwindles, right? Uh, kind of disappears and they can be in very negative mood, right? Uh, second trigger is certainty. When people lose clarity or certainty, uh, again, their positive energy uh, decreases or disappears altogether and they can become anxious and moody, right? Third trigger, autonomy. When people lose freedom or a sense of uh, having uh, some degree of control, of leeway, then again, positive energy goes away and negative mood can settle. Fourth trigger, can relatedness, which means kind of sense of belonging. When that decreases, uh, then uh, negative moods can settle in. And last, an extremely powerful trigger is a uh, fairness or rather perception of fairness when people lose a um, uh, sense of fairness when they perceive the situation is unfair to them then they can uh, harbor negative energy uh, negative moods right uh, and when you think of it uh, uh, the crisis we have and the relentless changes we have can all trigger those uh, five things negatively, in fact. Right? So the thing is, leaders will have to work with um, employees uh, and themselves by the, the, the way uh, that can be fragile um, in terms of uh, energy, right? Um, and so uh, we will see later on how coaching skills and coaching posture can help, of course, right? Uh, I thought it's important to uh, bring that to the table, easy to remember, uh, and so very relevant. Uh, now, uh, our asset as leaders, project managers, coaches, is essentially ourselves uh, because uh, the, truly, I, I profoundly believe the value others gain from us mostly comes from who we are with them. Uh, and that's uh, all great when we are a great coach or a great teacher or great project manager, right? Um, and now is eventually the time when I want uh, to uh, present coaching and then tie, tie coaching skills with what we've uh, uh, been contemplating all together. Rather than give you a definition of coaching, I would like to tell you a story. And the story is about a little boy, about seven years of age, um, in that garden somewhere in the US. Uh, and it's Sunday, and it's the family lunch time, and there is a visitor uh, to the family that day who happens to be one of my good friends, uh, and, um, and then he's a coach, right? Uh, and so the, the guy can observe that after having eaten his hamburger, the little boy escapes to his room, so totally bored with the adult conversation, yeah? And in his room, he puts on his Superman t-shirt and then discreetly goes to the garden. And there, as Superman, he decides he's going to climb that biggest of all trees in the garden, a pine tree, for the first time ever. And my friend is watching this. His parents uh, do not notice, actually. And the little boy can go up uh, by himself, actually, up to that level right, that level, right, um, 
And that's when his mother turns uh, her, her head around and sees him just there. What do you think she does? She shouts. What does she shout? Hey, come on, go down immediately. This is dangerous. You're going to fall. You're going to hurt yourself. What do you think is the impact on the kid? Uh, so the kid, uh, of course, is paralyzed uh, and shaking with fear just there, right? Uh, and my friend, uh, the uncle, right, that coach, who is also a good tree climber, goes in the garden, goes up the tree, and brings the king down, the, the little kid down. So that was Sunday lunch, right? Next, we are Monday morning. There is no school that day, and the mother of the little boy has gone to the market, right? Uh, and so there is just the little boy and my good friend uh, there on the sofa chatting, and suddenly my friend asks the little boy, hey, how about we go together to climb that big tree out there? And what do you think the little boy says? Um, of course, he's going to say, no, it's dangerous. I'm going to fall. Yeah. So then the, the, the uncle is patient and says, hey, you know, yeah, but we go together. I'll have your back. You know, we'll do it in a safe way. Right. Um, so eventually the little boy agrees, goes to the garden, climbs up the tree actually by himself. But then when he reaches that same level here, yeah, here as yesterday, right? Uh, what happens? He freezes again, terrified, paralyzed with fear. Yeah, it's obvious, right? Repetition, right? Of a traumatic experience, right? And then the uncle is underneath, uh, kind of uh, being the safety net uh, with his body, right? Uh, like a, a meter down, right? Uh, away from the boy. And then he tells the boy, hey, why don't you look around here? What do you see? So the boy kind of uh, lifts his head up, uh, which is a good way to disconnect from emotions, actually. Right? That's why with uh, babies who have a tantrum, we, we uh, uh, dangle something in front of their eyes. right? Um, so they disconnect uh, emotionally. And so the little boy looks around and say candidly, oh, I see branches. Yeah, you see branches, say the uncle, and so what are you going to do? And then the little boy say, I'm going to grab that branch and then put my foot here and pop, 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 pop. And the little boy climbs all the way to the top of the tree. And at the top of the tree, he looks around, sees the neighbor's houses uh, looking so small, and he's so proud and happy. And he looks down at the uncle and says, hey, Uncle, thank you so much for making me do this. And the uncle say, I didn't make you do this. I didn't tell you what to do. Nothing. I did nothing. You did it all by yourself. Now, my friends, that is exactly what coaching is. And the, the, the proof of the matter is the next day on Tuesday, when the uh, uncle is not around anymore, can the little um, boy climb safely up the tree? And sir, of course, is yes. Now, if instead that the, coach, the, the uncle had been consultative, right, and say, hey, you know, look at that branch, grab it and put your feet here, uh, put your feet here, and then do that, and then do that. Would the little boy climb the tree again without the uncle? The answer is no, obviously, right? Um, and, and, and so that is the essence of coaching, right? Uh, instead of advising or telling, which leads to dependence, uh, coaching obviously leads to confidence, um, healthy confidence, performance, and autonomy, yeah? Uh, autonomy being the word and that brings us back to conductor number two who made his uh, musician so uh, able collectively to create beauty autonomously that uh, they didn't need, need him to be there anymore right um, and for those of uh, us who like to have on this um, I would say coaching enhances situational and self-awareness develops solutions and ensures that actions are taken until success uh, uh, and increases confidence and uh, autonomy, right? And at its core, it's uh, 
a very collaborative uh, act. And I have prepared a visual for, um, for us today, right? Uh, in the hope that perhaps uh, it will speak to you. Uh, and it's about the traits of a collaborative leader or a collaborative team uh, member. Uh, and it's presented as if collaboration was an Olympic discipline, right? So there is a bronze medal uh, for uh, the team member, right? Uh, the guy who brings out his or her best. Better than the contrary, yeah? But that falls very far short of silver. Silver goes to the guy who, in addition, knows how to bring out others' best. And that guy is immensely more precious to the company and to the team, of course, right? Uh, by the way, that's what coaching skills do, right? They help people bring out their best, of course, right? Now, there is an even more precious kind of guy in the company, right? Uh, that's the gold medalist, right? And that one brings out her best, uh, others' best, and also the team's best, right? Super precious. Bringing the team's best practically means observing that perhaps part of the team members are not engaged in the conversation anymore and inviting them to engage again or noticing that the team carefully avoids to talk about the elephant in the room, that awkward topic uh, that nobody dares to uh, bring in, right? And that gold medalist will bring in the elephant in the room. Now the platinum medal in this special Olympic goes to the guy who, in addition, uh, the organization's best, right? Far more valuable. So each level is infinitely more valuable to the business, right? Coaching skills help people do all of uh, this, in fact, right? Uh, help, coaching skills also help uh, develop uh, agility because just like uh, um, agile people, right? Uh, people in coaching, people who are being coached uh, are really enabled to uh, be eager learners, keen to experiment, comfortable not knowing, learning from mistakes, versatile thinkers, and uh, and also courageous decision makers because time matters, right? Um, so we've got here some links between uh, leadership uh, acquired for our bunny world, uh, what coaching does, uh, and, and now we've got to kind of uh, uh, close the loop, right? And the way to close the loop uh, uh, for me uh, is to check in what's going on in some of the most successful companies in bunny environment uh, and what leadership and management behaviors they uh, train their people to do. At Google, um, there are these famous 10 behaviors for quite a few years now, right? Uh, and I work for Google and uh, I can see those behaviors everywhere I go um, uh, and uh, they do great service to the company. First behavior demanded from a leader, not second, is be a good coach. Second comes close and powers team does not micromanage. And then there is more that you can discover uh, later on, right? Uh, nine and 10 have been added after the first eight uh, are about collaborating across functions. Uh, and number 10, being a strong decision maker, because again, um, agility uh, and speed do matter to value creation in business, right? Uh, with uh, this in mind, um, it's, impo it's useful to look at Apple. You know, Apple was fantastically developed by Steve Jobs, very number one conductor, very authoritative um, uh, leader, right? Uh, and micromanaging. And that was great for the first 15 years of Apple. And then Steve Jobs uh, decided that he, uh, it was time to uh, appoint his successor. He chose Tim Cook, totally, totally different. Tim Cook has served Apple equally fantastically as Tim Job did in the last uh, kind of 15 years, right? With totally different leadership style. And Steve Jobs hired him for his different leadership style in sync with the times uh, uh, of Tim Cook, right? And when we ask about uh, Tim Cook, what are critical lessons uh, for leadership that he learned. Uh, the first one is um, dare to take risk, of course, uh, otherwise you uh, stall, right? Uh, and then shrink and die. Second, he says, and that's very interesting, right? Focus and listen attentively to those you speak with. Third, trust others around you. Diversity is important. Be humble, 
um, the power of humility and vulnerability is extremely precious. It enables others to be themselves, to be real, everything to be saved, uh, and therefore more value to be created, right? Admit it when you're wrong, that's vulnerability, right? Yeah. And then the question here is which of these features are um, in uh, coaching skills and uh, in the posture of a coach? All six of them, of course, right? Uh, I'll give you a video that explains a li little bit more about coaching skills at the end, right? So you can, um, you, you can dive there if you're interested, particularly for those of you uh, who may uh, consider getting a coaching education, right? Um, now, uh, I'm taking you to Microsoft. Uh, so new CEO for the last year and a half, right? Uh, of course, like any new CEO, he has, uh, with his leadership team, redefined the mission, the leadership principles and all that, right? Uh, and the mission of um, Microsoft now stands as <clears throat> empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Coincidentally, it's pretty much the mission of coaching. Now, leadership principles at uh, Microsoft uh, have three pillars. Create clarity, generate energy, deliver success. Uh, and I'll uh, skip the rest that you can see at uh, your leisure um, to just um, tell you that uh, creating clarity is what we do in a coaching conversation. And then we generate energy, right? By making sure that those five triggers I mentioned earlier about self-esteem and certainty, clarity, um, and then autonomy, then uh, relationships, uh, belonging, and uh, fairness are activated, right? So that generates the best, strongest energy possible. And of course, we are very tenacious. We never let go. We are agile, if necessary, when necessary, so we achieve success, right? So it's very interesting that the mission of Microsoft and the leadership principles are really um, at the core of uh, what coaching is about. About, right? Um, and with this, I'd love to uh, skip a couple of slides that are really for you to look at later on to show you, <clears throat> because I promised that in the write up of this uh, uh, conversation, right? The best coaching session ever. It lasts two minutes and 30 seconds. It's um, in the movie Ray about Ray Charles, right? That uh, fantastic jazz musician who became. Blind, when he was about seven years of age, uh, he could see pretty well before. Uh, and I'll show you the moment in the movie where his mother sees that her adorable little child is losing eyesight so much that he's going to be blind. And I'd love that you observe a lot more the mother and her choices of behaviors uh, than the little kid. Um, because then you will see uh, why I show this as the best coaching session ever in just over two minutes. Uh,
I hear you too, Mama. You're right there. And of course, she can be so very, <clears throat> sorry, happy, right? She just enabled her son to realize he can be independent and how he can be independent. Right. Uh, and of course, that mother is the best coach in the world. Right. Um, <clears throat> the uh, two, three minutes uh, in that little boy's life are totally life transforming. And the story is uh, uh, that he went on to become uh, very successful. The mother was also crying because uh, uh, as he had achieved independence, kind of autonomy, right? He could be dropped at an orphanage, uh, and that she decided to do because the orphanage would give him an education that she could not afford to pay, very sadly. So it's very poignant, uh, very sad, because uh, he never got to see his mother again after she had, uh, for the love of him uh, and his future, uh, dropped him at the orphanage. Um, I'd love to highlight uh, the importance of silence uh, in coaching. It's full of answers and it gives uh, people to create more intelligence. Right? And perhaps in project management, at times, extra silence can also create more value. I'd love also to uh, leave you with the visual of uh, the mentor and the mentee in my country, Thailand here, right? Uh, and uh, the picture of the coach and the coachee, coachee being the person who is coach, right? Uh, and definitely the coach is that little candid, uh, challenging, curious uh, student and the coachee is the one who knows uh, and who is uh, enabled to teach the solution to his problem uh, because Teaching is the best way to learn. Um, and last word, perhaps uh, on a personal note, uh, for me, in essence, coaching is an intelligent, growth-driven act of love. And as uh, such, uh, uh, it's really important to, um, to, to have it at the core of leadership going uh, forward. Um, and that may be why Eric Schmidt, whom you know as the CEO of Google over the first 20 years, retired three years ago. The first thing he did, uh, Schmidt, in his retirement was write this great book, A Trillion Dollar Coach, about Bill Campbell, his coach, uh, uh, because uh, he thought that Bill Campbell had uh, really helped uh, many Silicon Valley companies generate trillions of dollars of value by bringing more collective intelligence through coaching skills in, in the ecosystem of the Valley out there in California. Um, I want to thank you all just before we go into our conversation uh, for staying with me uh, for such a quick download, right? Uh, we have very little time and um, just uh, to me to give you all I could, right? I uh, want to thank uh, Christina Baradas for inviting me to be with you all uh, today uh, and to um, uh, and uh, and uh, that is when uh, you can download the slide deck either in the chat box with the link or uh, if you prefer by scanning the QR code um, here on the screen, in fact, whichever way you will find more slides in it than I showed. Uh, I hope they will uh, speak to you, right, or, or be useful in your work. And in the chat box also, what we've prepared is uh, three links to uh, uh, three things, two webinars. Uh, um, one is uh, about 10 insights and 10 tips to coach at your best if you want to go deeper into coaching skills, right? And it's in English. The next one is the same topic, 10 insights and 10 tips to coach at your best. And it's in French, Francais, pour ceux qui parlent français. Uh, and the third link is uh, about a coaching demo, a full coaching demo. Um, and so for those of you who want to uh, see... Uh, 
what coaching really looks like, right? But you can you you, you can go and see that, right? So, and that's my answer to one of the questions you asked uh, in advance of our talk today. Was uh, how to be a successful coach and how to uh, start a coach career, right? You'll find answers to uh, uh, that uh, question that one of you asked, and thanks for asking it. Another question uh, was, um, um, what are the, rele the most relevant coaching skills that apply uh, uh, to a leader? So I hope uh, that's uh, what you got, right? Uh, because my, my presentation was really the answer to that question. Right, um, and then the third question that was asked before the talk was, uh, "What are uh, your uh, top three tips uh, to deal with difficult uh, project team members, especially when they have a bigger grade than the project manager?" Very real situation, right? Thank you so very much for the question, right? So, uh, I prepared three things here. Um, the first one uh, is classical conflict management, right? It's uh, find out the hidden wants of that difficult person, their hidden fears, uh, yeah, and, and their hidden agenda, right? Find that out. Uh, and then assess, of course, if there is a way that they can get what they secretly want or um, or, or or not. And, and uh, of course, if what they want um, is not the best for the organization, then uh, probably a conversation about that will be good. Tip number two is um, really the power of uh, asking uh people to explain uh what they go for right uh, so if they say something that may be arrogant dismissive borderline disrespectful not value creating uh then we can come in with the uh question hey thanks for sharing that right please help me understand how this creates value or please help me understand um, more about the logic behind, uh, or uh, please help me understand how this uh, aligns with what we are collectively trying to uh, achieve here. The third, um, third tip here is what I like to call the uh, sumo technique. Perhaps some of you have seen in Tokyo um, those uh, matches between sumos, right? Those huge Japanese uh, fighters, like huge, huge, right? Uh, I, I, I remember I, I've been there once um, and just once because it's super expensive. <laughs> and, and so there was this huge sumo, right? And then a smaller one, right? And they they were going to fight, right? For fit, for, you know how it goes. 14 minutes is uh, like... Um, um ceremony right uh, very uh, kind of uh, uh, spiritual right? 14 minutes and then in less than one minute they fight and one falls and it's over right and and i observed that uh, the smaller one yeah and and that was fascinating to me because of course the the, the bigger one being heavier is uh, technically stronger and there's nothing uh, uh, that the smaller one uh, can uh, compete with in terms of strengths. But of course, uh, the sumo, the smaller sumo used the superior strengths of the aggressor, bigger sumo, against the bigger sumo, right? That's what we can do with uh, difficult uh, people at times, right? It's use their uh, negative energy against themselves, right? Um, and and uh, actually, uh especially when they are emotional like aggressive um uh, uh and, and then uh you say for example hmm, interesting tell me more right or please can you please elaborate right and you take them at the low because if they are emotional they cannot uh, use their uh, left brain uh very effectively right it's too polluted by uh, all sorts of things in their brain that are created by emotions right um, so that's how you can have them roll over right uh, so i hope those three tips um help uh, christina we may not have even one more minute for question we are the you are the queen christina you tell me um what's next and maybe it's a conclusion already 
Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Thank you very much for your inspiring and thought-provocative talk and all these videos that I'm sure many of us will still remember uh, in the next days and thinking back, traveling back to this moment to reflect about those. Uh, maybe a question. We are five minutes from the end, but um, on the top of the questions that came in, registration and thank you Jean-Francois for addressing those. Uh, any question? Hot question at the moment? Any curiosity that you would like to bring up right now? And also any experience sharing because I, I, I offered uh, just a bit of my experience and I'm so curious um, that you um, about your own experience right about the be the coach of the future, right? Um, I'm sure everyone has gems of experience. We have so little time, but uh, everything's welcome. Yeah. If you prefer, you can also write it in the chat or open your micro microphone and let us know. And congratulations uh, to you all on the 20th anniversary of PMI Portug Portugal. You've got so much to be proud of. Uh, I follow you on LinkedIn and I see there is so much going on. It's really amazing. So well done to all of you. And Isabelina, Isabelina you are at the helm. Uh, uh, great job, you and the team. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Well, I thank you. I think if we don't have any questions, well, we have here a comment. What an amazing session. Thank you. Thank this you, is really. for you, Jean-Francois. Uh, I would suggest that Isabelina closes the session. And then at the end, we will have also uh, the opportunity to watch the PDU code claim. The um, links that Jean-Francois mentioned are all on the chat. Please feel free to uh, copy paste them and uh, take quality time then to investigate them further. Thank you. Isabelina. Well, thank you so much, Jean-François, for such an uh, inspiring, uh, emotional, and learning uh, presentation. We really need to listen more to that. And completely aligned with the, uh, the theme that we have for this 20 years anniversary, which is Art and Science of Project Leadership, in the affirmative, probably in the imperative, to join the two worlds, the dual worlds of heart and science, power skills and technical skills. And you stress that very, very, very well and very, very clear in our presentation. So we have here a very value-added uh, session. I am going to Re uh, see the record again because there's a lot of things I want to review for sure and just enjoy because I was so marveled and so emotional by everything that you said and we have a lot of information here too I liked everything even the, the, the reference to Tim Cook and Steve Jobs because I am a great admirer of uh, late Steve Jobs but even greater of Tim Cook because Tim Jobs promoted the change but Tim Cook maintains the change within values. And if you listen to the recent, uh, uh, to the recent records of Apple, there is a scene where all the direction team with Tim Cook receive Mother Nature, explaining how what they do with success it's not just business success, it's also to sell on a sustainability and zero carbon achievement. So this is very interesting. I, I hope I hope you see it because it's it's a very interesting. They get a, an artist to perform Mother Nature, asking them, everybody had to in the board had to explain what they have did in all the departments to ensure sustainability and carbon zero work. This is fantastic. So we have a, a, a great food for thought. 
and um, let's receive this. Let's have you more. Let's read everything that you gave us to read because we really need this continue to, to this uh, learning and interiorizing because to be this kind of leader is not easy. It means a lot of work. And to create the coll collaborative intelligence, which is something that I really like. Uh, it's it's something that really is a, a team job. So we are very proud to have in the board, actually, a certified coach and mentor, Cristina Barradas. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and the fact that she's with us for some years as a volunteer and now as a board executive member, I must tell that has had significant impact in the way we do leadership and project management. So you made me think about how lucky we are to have such great people uh, with us as volunteers. So thank you very much. I would like to ask everybody to come to our conference uh, on the theme Art and Science of Project Leadership that will happen on the 12th and 13th October. This will be another great, great moment. If you can, how oh, you are in Bangkok, uh, but <laughs> nice weather. Uh, but I will ask everybody to consider to come to our conference because it's going to be one of the top moments of a grant here of working with a lot of collaborative intelligence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Thanks very much, uh, Isabella and the team and Christina. Yeah, all take care. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. We have Hello. another question here for Jean-Francois. I will share it with you. It's in the chat. And maybe we can find a way to answer back to the community. Thanks very Thank much, you. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.